This is Eric Siegel, co-founder and CEO of Gooder AI. And in this video, I'm going to demo our product, which is the business interface for predictive AI to realize business value by testing and visualizing business performance. AI needs a business user console because data scientists always evaluate their AI models, but almost never evaluate them. Gooder AI addresses a long-standing fundamental problem with the typical model deployment process, which is that data scientists generally only evaluate how good a model is, how well it performs in these relatively arcane technical measures of performance or metrics called precision recall, lift, uh, area under the receiver, operating characteristic curve, that's one of the most popular ones. Um, even accuracy is just a technical metric. And technical metrics tell you that the model does pretty good. It only tells you the relative performance. It basically is a way to measure the pure predictive performance sort of abstractly. Only relative performance in comparison to a baseline like random guessing. But <laughs> I've been in the field of machine learning for 32 years and it's high time that we actually evaluate how good these models are when we're determining whether and how to deploy them in terms of absolute business value rather than relative pure predictive performance in terms of business metrics, very straightforward metrics that all business stakeholders understand that speak to the um, strategy of the organization like profit. Now, if you're new to the field of machine learning or you're not a data scientist, you may be surprised to hear that this is not normally on the menu, but it's not. Profit savings, returns, return on investment, uh, top line revenue, bottom line revenue, any and all like KPI, key performance indicator, also needs to be part of the stress testing of a model during the development process. Model development, this is where we're using the amazing rocket science known as machine learning methods, right? Some people call it AI. And, but it's a semi-automatic process where you're training, that's where you're learning from the data, and then evaluating, iterating between those. The evaluation is with human eyes, at least at first with the data scientist's eyes. So by evaluate, I'm talking about, there's a lot of synonyms for that, but basically quantitative, quantitatively assessing the performance during what's an iterative process of some sort of manual trial and error typically where we're seeing how well did the data pan out when we apply when we tried to learn from it with this machine learning algorithm um, the problem is that it's so limited if you're only evaluating in terms of these general um, technical metrics these pure predictive performance which tells you okay yeah it's better than guessing so it's potentially valuable but exactly how valuable is it in the lingua franca of business that is actual business metrics like profit so in that sense, the ability to navigate to business value during the model development process is broken. The challenge, and maybe one of the main reasons that we're not yet seeing this as standard practice, is that it's a little, it's a little bit different to say, hey, look, this model yet yeah, has this performance metric of such and such. It's much better than guessing. But then to also say, you know, it's worth a million bucks. And you can't, in an absolute sense, say it's worth a million bucks because it depends on exactly how you use it. So Gooder AI is the first full-scale platform for evaluating in those terms that are relative to the, to the deployment plan. So you have to involve deployment particulars to get there. But by doing that, now model development is navigating towards business value. And the second business problem that this solution solves is that it provides stakeholders visibility. So the client of the data scientist, the person in charge of operations meant to be improved by the model. This person uh, can now see how well the model performs in concrete business terms, how much value from a business perspective it could potentially deliver, depending on how it was deployed. So I'll come back to a couple slides. Let's jump right into the demo. This is called a profit curve. So this is comparing three models for targeting marketing. The bottom left here is a gains curve. This is super standard. Most data scientists are very familiar with this. Um, and the idea is as you go from left to right, how many individual cases am I finding that will, will respond if marketed to? You want to 
spend two dollars sending a brochure to somebody who's more likely to actually buy in response and that's the job of the model is to put those likelihoods and therefore order it. So you can think of the ordering from left to right. But the Y coordinate is a technical metric. It's basically how much better than guessing are we doing. That's called lift. Uh, gains curve reflects lift. So that's a technical metric. But why not also paint that picture where the Y coordinate is a business metric? In this case, the profit of the marketing campaign, depending on how far down that list from left to right, most likely to buy to the least likely to buy that we go. Obviously, if we stop here, it's where with the best of these three models, your, your profit's going to potentially peak. But stakeholders can understand this graph, right? It's a two-dimensional graph where both dimensions are business relevant. Neither are arcane and technical. The X coordinate is how many customers are we going to contact as ordered or prioritized by the predictive model. That's the general use case for many predictive applications, including for targeting marketing. And then the Y coordinate is the actual profit of the marketing campaign, how much you, which depends overall on how much you spend contacting these particular individuals. So at around 30%, we're going to peak. The stakeholder, though, may look at the story that this curve uh, tells and say, no, no, actually, let's go to 83%. And we're going to break even. But because I'm less concerned strategically with immediate term profits, and I'm looking at a little bit more of the longer or medium term, uh, it, it may be that we love the idea of marketing to that many people essentially for free, arguably much better than marketing to 100% of the list for a cost of $750,000. Now, the shape of this curve, so in deployment, you're deciding where to draw that line, but the modeling doesn't tell you that. The data scientists cannot determine that in a vacuum. But it also, the shape of the curve is determined by business pragmatics, business inputs. In this case, it's a relatively simple way of estimating profit of the, of the campaign if deployed in this way, based just on these two factors. Now, this platform, Gooder AI, allows you to put any and all competing KPIs up here. The first row in this case corresponds with the actual chart you're looking at, so it's just the same values. But then you can compare it to any and all other KPIs. In general, KPIs or, or business metrics can be defined under the hood with configuration very simply, any way you want, whatever your particular business metric or metrics that you're trying to find trade-offs between uh, uh, have been defined at your organization. Um, so the thing that matters here is how much does it cost to contact somebody? We've got this at $10 with the marketing. And how much do you get if they actually positively respond? Well, these things, these business inputs, are always subject to change. And that's why you need to be able to change them. And that changes the story accordingly. For example, let's say we were considering as a company going to a different vendor where our margins would improve per response and go up to five go up by five dollars or we're considering going to a black and white brochure and we cut in half so the story changes stakeholders can take a look at this make an informed decision from a business perspective on deployment um, here we have uh, a savings curve for fraud detection for payment cards so the bank needs to decide you know where do you draw this line how many of the more likely fraudulent card transactions and that's what the fraud detection model does and we once again we've ordered from left to right most likely in this case to be fraud down to least likely as a bank we're going to definitely only block as potential fraud a few percent at most of the transactions maybe just one and a half percent so let's zoom in there again we're comparing three models and the shape of this curve helps us decide in terms of overall savings. And the way that that's calculated is based, it's sort of, it's this, oops, I just zoomed, uh, zoomed a little bit by accident. So I'll just get back to where I was. Um, when you, you can also think of it in terms of loss, right? And the, the savings curve is essentially the loss curve upside down. Loss or costs, the aggregate cost, comes out of these two main things, which is like, what does it cost when you wrongly block a legitimate cardholder's transaction? And you've inconvenienced the cardholder, maybe it costs on average around $100. Or you have um, allowed fraud to go through, maybe on average that's $500, and the bank typically has to eat that cost. So uh, once again, those two 
same two things here, they they change the story, right? And it depends on your region, your transactions, your customers, the prevalence of fraud, and this kind of thing. Again, this is a relatively simple example of calculating the business metric. Just in terms of these two business inputs, it can be done in much more sophisticated ways. Although typically it doesn't get doesn't typically need to get that sophisticated. It does just end up being some arithmetic typically, but you want to be able to customize it to uh, according to your business and the pragmatics in, in that context. Um, once again, w once these have been set to something that you're satisfied or close enough pr approximations or known from empirical you know, searches in the data and what have you, collected accordingly, now you can move that threshold and decide, oh, I'm going to block the top 3% most likely to be fraudulent. Uh, well, that looks like a, about where I'm going to peak in my savings. But on the other hand, I don't want to inconvenience too often, right? Maybe it should be down here. So here's one of the other KPIs, which is just the absolute count of false positive. That is uh, wrong, wrongly blocking legitimate transactions, inconveniencing customers. That absolute count is another trade-off you want to look at, right? This is a big number, right? This is every year your medium-sized bank is causing this inconvenience this many times, 245,000 times uh, to customers. Um, so that's what you get with this visibility, with this user interface. Um, and that's what it takes. So if we're going to make this fundamental move from technical metrics, which don't provide visibility into business value, they tell you very little very indirectly about the potential business value and make this move to actual business metrics like savings and profit. It depends on the deployment particulars and business context. So you need a specialized graphical user interface, a way to visualize it, to interact, try what if scenarios and get the intuition. That's what the solution does. Um, one more example, here we are uh, targeting retention offers to potential uh, B2B churners, customers that are gonna quit or defect for a payroll company. Once again, zooming in because you know we're gonna only expand this expensive retention campaign, let's say something that costs on average $282 uh, for the whining and dining of a customer considered at risk of leaving, right? So you've got a retention team, they could be spending various amounts, it depends on what your plans are. And then accordingly, well, when they do apply that treatment and they fly over to the corporate client and wine and dine them or what have you, whatever the treatment is, um, are you going to, if they were actually going to, if the prediction were, was correct, which it is sometimes, but not always, what, what are the chances you'll win them back? Well, 7% may be pessimistic, right? And we want to get some empirical sense of that. But before we really know, because we're, it's a moving target. We're not sure how we're going to wine and dine, what the treatment's going to be. But get a sense of how big a difference it makes. So this is the win back rate. Another factor would be, well, if you do win them back, how much of their current annual revenue do you win? How many more years do we get them as a customer? 100%, one more year, 200%. That would be better, two more years of revenue. So again, the story changes. Then you can move that decision threshold, decide how many to treat. Again, ordered from most risk of departure, of defection. This is called a churn model for targeting retention down to least. Um, and here we have used a GPT-3 large language model as a predictive model. Uh, this is a universal solution that works for any kind of model produced with any solution, as long as you're using it as a predictive model, which basically means you're triaging or pri prioritizing some kind of treatment. In this case, misinformation similar to fraud. You've got saving and loss curve, which is basically the same curve upside down. You can move the threshold, and in this case, we've got that simple model of basically what you can call false positive and false negative costs, right? The false negative, uh, excuse me, false positive cost is, well, look, we've manually spent time auditing this post on social media as potential misinformation, but it's not misinformation. So on average, let's say that's cost five bucks. False negative cost, which is like we allowed, we, we didn't catch the misinformation and we let it fly. That's subjective in this particular case. And that's another reason you need to be able to move these parameters, move these business inputs, because look, if something's subjective, what does it cost to not notice a healthcare patient had a heart attack and you allow them to leave the hospital, right? How do you rate that cost compared to scaring a patient unnecessarily by 
incorrectly diagnosing that they did have a heart attack when they didn't. What's the relative cost of those? One's probably worse than the other, but there's a subjectivity, same thing with misinformation, probably spam detection. That's the way the world works, but you got to pick something directionally and it, it's just a real world question. So the lawyer comes in and said, hey, our social media company is getting slammed in the press because of all this misinformation that's flying. It's literally costing us not $10 every time we let it fly, but more like $30. So you need to be able to play with these and put, see how it changes the story. That naturally pushes over to the right as far as the treatment, which in this case would be to investigate the post. And then I'll just show you a glance here of uh, credit scoring, deciding you know how many applicants for home equity line of credit. This, this like most of, the, most of my demos, is based on real data, based on a real model. This is showing the performance, again, comparing three models and then a baseline of, of basically random guessing. Um, so I'll just wrap up with these basic ideas. This is after you train the model, you've done the rocket science, you've learned from the model, and you're deciding whether to deploy it. Although the train, evaluate, train, test, train, test, these two are very tightly iterated, so this loops a lot. What data scientists call evaluate is a limited thing, which typically they just use the model training tool itself, and then they just, um, whatever limited capabilities of quantitating quantitatively stress testing or evaluating, typically only uh, with regard to technical metrics and, and not allowing the interactivity and experimental what if to get that visualization intuition. So much needed if you're moving to the deployment specific way of, of estimating business value. That's what you got to do if you want to move to business value. So they call it evaluate, but in this case, the solution's broader. It's a, it, it, it's, it's, generalizing that concept. So we're calling this type of software, a, it's a new category, call it machine learning value capture. And yes, it's pre-deployment. After you deploy, you also want to evaluate, ideally with a control set, and see just how much better did things go when they were guided by your model. But you also, during development, before deployment, want to be uh, heading things in the right direction so that it will be valuable. So essentially, this software category, ML value capture, is pre-deployment, but also after you deploy, it's for pre-redeployment. Reassess how do things go over the last month, um, and uh, uh, should we change the way it's deployed? Um, should we refresh the model with basically a challenger, champion challenger, compare them? Same, the same view, the same software solution, good or AI applies there as well. So ultimately, because we've we've decoupled the evaluation step, now calling it the broader term ML value capture, from the training solution. It's a separate software. You move over to the Gooder AI tab during the workflow, but you're evaluating the model all on the same held aside test set the data scientists were using anyway. And the benefit of doing that, of decoupling it, is that now the enterprise gains a singular uniform view across projects. Because Gooder AI is universal, will work with any model. Uh, for predictive use cases of machine learning or predictive AI. Um, your enterprise's ML projects inevitably use a whole bunch of different solutions, but now you have this one universal way of, of characterizing and visualizing and understanding their current and potential business value depending on whether, when, and how you deploy it. So that's the gist. There's a lot more to learn about it. This is a, a new paradigm, a new world where we're going to need to interact and try these models out in terms of potential deployment scenarios if we're going to be actually developing them with business value being measured as part of the process. If you're not measuring the business value, you're not pursuing business value. If you found this interesting, hit like and subscribe. Reach out to us with any questions or if you'd like to give Gooder a try on your predictive AI projects. Or feel free to ask any questions in the YouTube comments and we'll answer them.